Hello. Welcome to Shocktober 2018, when we await the coming of Halloween, the time of the year when all the dark beings of the world come out of hiding and flood our streets. It's a long-standing tradition when we consciously come into contact with the darker aspects of the world, monsters, death, and perhaps, above all, evil. Why are we so fascinated by death? It's been part of our cultures for as long as there have been recorded history. But where does all this come from? Is it perhaps on a basis in our religious traditions? And what are the stories trying to convey? These are the kind of questions we will be exploring in these videos. So get ready, turn down the lights, and I will take you through the story of evil. <laughs> In ancient Egypt, death was a big deal. Some of the most famous monuments and buildings from this period, like the pyramids, were built with the explicit reason of, of cheating impermanence and the transitory nature of the world. In other words, of cheating death. Nonetheless, death was a reality for the Egyptian, and it permeates their art and mythology. To these people, death wasn't the end, and they faced this difficult question by preparing meticulously for this event, and also by telling stories about what happens after. According to Egyptian thought, once you leave this world, you enter the afterlife, and depending on if you've been a good person in this mortal life, you might end up in a paradise-like land called the Field of Reeds. But to get to this blissful place, you had to face quite a few challenges on the way. The afterlife was thought to be kind of like a mirror to this world, which is why a lot of people were buried with their belongings and, and, and their sort of grave palaces, often mirrored their palaces in this world, because it is thought that that could help them on the other side. The soul or ka of a person had to be taken care of. The bodies were often mummified in a very long and complicated process in which every detail mattered. The mummification process was done uh, to preserve the body for all eternity so that the soul could recognize it and return to it. All the inner soft organs were removed, the brain, the heart and so on. They were often placed in jars next to the coffin. All moisture was removed from the body, it was packed with dry salt and then wrapped in linen, which created that classic mummy look we all love from the movies. After death, the person had to go through a number of chambers of a kind of hell, where they had to battle monsters and demons, they had to cross lakes of fire, this place in other words was not very pleasant at all, and not everyone made it to the other side. This is for example why we often see boats in the burial chambers of kings, because it is thought that they needed these boats to cross these lakes of fire and get to, to the eventual paradise land. But even if you got to the end of this terrible journey, you still weren't done. In later Egyptian mythology, once there, you were met by the god Osiris, god of the afterlife, uh, as well as Anubis, and a terrible monster or beast called the Amet. This was a beast made up of three different animals. It had the head of a crocodile, the upper body of a lion, and the lower body of a hippopotamus. It is especially interesting to consider that these three were, of course, the three animals that Egyptians fear the most, the, the most deadly animals that existed in this region at the time. And this is a perfect example of, of mythology and religion mirroring the society in which it is conceived, uh, in this case, where the three most deadly animals is, is, is combined into this terrible monster that is often known as the soul eater or devourer of souls. Once in this room, Anubis would take the heart of the deceased, which was considered the seed of the soul, uh, and he would place it on a scale uh, next to the feather of Ma'at. Uh, Ma'at in ancient Egypt was this concept of justice and order in the universe, also sometimes conceived of as a god. 
And now, if you had been a good person throughout your life, your heart would be light. And if it was lighter or as light as the feather of Ma'at, then you would be allowed to enter the field of reeds and live in paradise forever. However, if you've been a bad person, your heart was heavy, and if unfortunately your heart is heavier than the feather of Ma'at, then your heart was fed to the soul eater, and the person was doomed to spend eternity in oblivion. The Ahmed monster here is a perfect representation of what people fear the most, uh, a theme that is recurring in the history of mythology, religion, and storytelling throughout the world. You could say it is the point of telling such stories. Abstract ideas and fears are given a mythological embodiment and told in a language that made sense to the people who were exposed to it. In this case, the most terrible fate a person could experience is embodied by the three animals people fear the most. See the connection here? In ancient Greece, evil has a very clear mythological beginning. You see, there was this woman created by the gods called Pandora, who was created by Zeus in order to enact a revenge on the human race as well as uh, the god uh, Prometheus who had betrayed him. Zeus created Pandora and made her to be the most beautiful woman imaginable before sending her down to the world of men. But she was also given a box, although some say it was actually a jar, and yes, it is that Pandora's box. And now, under no circumstances was she to open this box, and for a while she actually didn't, but as time went on, uh, her curiosity got the better of her, and she, she just had to see what was inside, so she very carefully opened the lid, but it was already too late. All the evil, death, and sickness, and terrible things in this world had escaped and infected the world of men. In that very moment, death was created. Sickness, greed, envy, hatred, and all the darkness of the world. Thankfully, the world wasn't completely ruined because there was one last little thing left in this box, which Pandora also ultimately released, and that was hope. Moreover, in ancient Greece there existed the concept of the underworld, which also sometimes took the name of its ruler, Hades. It was here that the souls of the dead would be transported. It, it's kind of similar to the Egyptian idea of the afterlife, except there's no weighing of the heart, no judgment as such, and no real paradise. Uh, come to think of it, it, maybe it isn't that similar to Egyptian mythology at all. Anyway, the point is that there is an afterlife, and in ancient Greece, this afterlife was kind of meaningless. It was spent in Hades, and, and you were just kind of there. This stands in stark contrast to two other religions that are, uh, to a larger degree at least, still alive today, and that is the Indian traditions of Hinduism and Buddhism. Like later monotheistic religions, as well as to some degree the Egyptian mythology, there exists in Buddhism and Hinduism this idea of being rewarded or, or punished for, for your actions in this life, only it takes a slightly different form. Rather than being judged as such and sent to a heaven or hell, in the Indian religions they believe in reincarnation. That is, after death your soul is reborn in a new body. Depending on how you act in this life, you may end up getting a worse or better life the next time around. So for example, if you're a good person, you'll get a better life next time, and if you're a bad person, you'll get a worse one. So you may end up being a, an animal, like a dog, because that seems so awful, right? You're one hand. Nonetheless, all of this is determined by a very famous concept called karma that you gather throughout your life. And the whole goal of this long journey is to eventually, and hopefully, be released from this eternal uh, death and rebirth cycle and achieve liberation, known as moksha. Now, if we turn to Persia and the religion of Zoroastrianism, which historically is one of the most significant and important religions of all time, we're going to run into a perspective on evil that may appear very similar to some of us in the West. There is some scholarly debate on whether Zoroastrianism should be considered a monotheistic or a dualistic faith. That is, 
if they believe and worship one almighty god or two deities. But nonetheless, whichever position you hold, the main aspects of its theology still remain. To Zoroastrians, the world is made up of two opposing forces, that of light and good, and that of evil and darkness. The world was created by the god Ahura Mazda, an all-good and benevolent creator. This also means that in its original state, the world was perfect. There was no evil, no darkness, no death, nothing of this sort. However, there was another being called Angra Menu, which could be seen as the embodiment of darkness. And he managed to corrupt the world and infuse it with everything that is dark, evil and negative. The disagreements among historians, scholars and Zoroastrians themselves uh, regard whether or not Angra Menu should be considered a god in himself that stands in opposition or beside Ahura Mazda, or if he is simply part of uh, Ahura Mazda's creation as such. But nonetheless, the deed was done, and this was the start of the long battle between light and darkness that would rage throughout creation. You see, to Zoroastrians, the world as we know it is a constant battle between good and evil, between light and darkness. Our very purpose in this world is to fight the darkness little by little, constantly pushing it back and promoting the good things in the world, so that eventually evil will be forever annihilated and the world returns to its original perfection. What is especially significant here is the emphasis on the essence of evil, which is embodied in Angra Menu, a deity or a spirit. An evil being that stands in opposition and as a nemesis to the benevolent creator god. Sound familiar? You've probably guessed at this point that the idea of Angra Menu in Zoroastrianism is very likely the source of the Christian and, and monotheistic idea of the devil. Not only that, but in Zoroastrianism there are lesser spirits that serve Ahura Mazda and lesser spirits that serve Angra Menu, which likely corresponds to the later concepts of angels and demons. There are many interesting aspects of Zoroastrianism and its influence on the later Abrahamic religions, but we'll talk about that at another time. Uh, what is particularly interesting now is this concept of evil that appears in this tradition. We see that different ancient religious traditions tackle subjects such as death, sickness and violence in different ways. From the Egyptian concepts of the afterlife and the soul devourer, to Pandora's box and also the Indian traditions. Finally, in Zoroastrianism, evil is given a very concrete identity as a constant force in the world that is in opposition to the forces of good, embodied in the being of Angra Menu and his servants. A dualistic outlook that would have enormous impact on the history of ideas and the history of evil itself. In the next episode, we will be looking at the Judeo-Christian Islamic framework and how the idea of the devil and his demons has evolved and changed. I'll see you then. <laughs>